Good day everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, that is hosted by the third year Bachelor of Physical Education students, of Sorsogon State University. In this webcast, we will be learning about the authentic assessment of the effective domain. We will talk about these three major topics. These are, effective targets, appropriate methods, and other effective measures and assessments. Now, get your pen and paper, and be ready to take some notes, because today for sure you will learn a lot and have fun at the same time. Let's start with the effective targets. In effective targets we will discuss 10 subtopics. These are, attitude, motivation, values, self-concept, self-efficacy, anxiety, creativity, epistemological beliefs, focus of control and lastly, interests. Let's begin with attitude. Good day everyone, I'm your teacher May. I will be discussing effective domain focusing in attitudes. There are three different kinds of learning. Learning about what you can know, learning about what you can do, and learning about what you can feel. It also differs as knowledge, skills, and attitudes. In here, I will be focusing more closely to attitudes. Affective domain is one of the three domains of Bloom's taxonomy. It involves feelings, attitudes, and emotions. It includes by which people deals with external and internal phenomenon emotionally such as values, enthusiasm, and motivations. Affective domain can be broken down into hierarchy includes five different levels of attitudes ranging from the simplest, basically the willingness to pay attention, and the most complex when a person's behavior is consistently controlled by their value system. First is receiving. Learners are willing to pay attention and listen with respect. Second is responding. Learners actively respond and participate. Third, valuing. Person places values on behavior, idea, person, institution, and so on and so forth. Fourth, organization. Learners prioritize values and resolves conflict between them. Fifth, internalizing values. Learner's control system is internalized and controls his or her behavior. Hi, hello everyone. This is Federico Diu Jr. from Bachelor of Physical Education. And today we are going to talk about motivation. We all know that motivation is not only important in its own right. It is also important predictor of learning and achievement. Students who are motivated to learn can persist longer, produce higher quality effort, learn more deeply, and perform better in class and on a standardized test. Since motivation itself provides a insight into what an individual wants to do and what they need from a role in order to be engaged successfully. So with that so the question I mean the question is how we could able help our students to understand the purpose behind regularly administered classroom assessment and gain motivation through that understanding. With that said, I have a classroom tip for you. So, my first tip for you is the first one is to create a student-centered classroom assessment. Meaning to say, here, for many students who struggle with motivation, giving them more ownership and opportunity to offer their own opinions can be helpful. Take advantage of this fact and work to make your assessment more student-driven. For instance, if your assessment involves a writing ass assessment, start by having each student or group or students analyze both an excellent writing assessment and a poor one. Then, Instead of telling them yourself, ask your student to identify what makes the good example strong and poor example weak. This encourages them to practice analytical skills and form arguments rather than simply thinking in and repeating back information. It is also help your students to prepare for their own future 
writing assignments in an active manner. So, my second tip for you is you have to tap into an intrinsic motivation. What I am what what I am in. Here, we all know that interest and motivation go hand in hand. So, when creating your classroom exams, try to make question as relevant to your students' personal interest as possible. Brainstorm things that your students care about and get excited about. The topics that they discuss in casual conversation with their classmates and friends. Maybe this includes box office movie hits, popular singers, or favorite sports teams, or the latest technological trends. Integrate these topics into your lessons and eventual assessment to pique your students' interest and get them to engage with the underlying concepts and material. Our third is, my third tip for you is give a student a say. Here, letting your students make some decision about their assessment is a great way to give them more ownership over their learning and reap the motivational benefits that can provide yeah that can provide them consider giving your students some choices in the format that they are assessed in and switch up the format you use to accommodate different students preferences this also gives your students the chance to display their knowledge of various concepts in different ways. For example, if you're teaching unit of the civil rights movement, some students may excel at explaining the underlying costs and effects of the movement on an essay-based exam. Others may have an equally strong grasp of the content, but better communicate it through a more project-based approach like developing a basic website or collaborating with classmates to create a short performance. Next tip is you have to take the time to personalize, meaning taking the time to work individually with students and tailoring elements of your lesson to their needs can go a long way in increasing their motivation for classroom assessments. When you see the students are doing well with material, Challenge them slightly beyond grade level to keep them engaged. Similarly, take the time to work with your struggling students. Help them with those concepts they are finding and the most challenging one. And offer them the learning strategies to take in material in a way that aligns with their strength. My last tip for you is you have to encourage students to monitor their own progress. What I mean? Here, when students are able to see their progress towards various academic goals, it can be a significant performance throughout the grading period. This give you I mean this give your students a continuous visual of their assessment outcomes to date and can help them to recognize steps they need to take to improve their performance moving forward. Additionally, consider holding student-led conferences which with each student and their parents or caregivers giving, you, giving your students uh, the chance to explain uh, their own class and assessment progress to someone they care about can be motivating than a conversation lead by you. So, in conclusion, to help our students to keep motivated, we need to provide them a real-world exam. What I mean is give them a real life or put them into a real life context because from this, they could clearly see how doing well serves their best interest. So, that would be all for our topic about motivation and I hope that you learned something thank you hello everyone I am here to explain to you the meaning of values on effective targets in relation to the effective domain okay so values is defined as a principle standard 
or quality considered inherent, inherently worthwhile or desirable. So, individuals, groups, and w in the whole society hold values. So, values are what motivate and fulfill you. Basically, as a future educator, we need to know our learners' point of view on certain things, which will be influenced by the values that they uphold. In addition to this, if you have knowledge on our students' values, we can easily think of ways on how to approach each of them in respect to each of their values. In order for us to work harmoniously to achieve our respective goals, which is our goal as a future educator is to successfully transfer knowledge onto them, while their, their goal is to absorb and understand what is being taught to them. That's all and thanks. Hi everyone! Kamusta? I am Cindy Shane Diona and today we will talk about one of the effective target in the effective domain which is the self-concept. We all know that effective domain is one of the three domains in the Bloom's taxonomy that emphasize a feeling tone, an emotion, or degree of acceptance or rejection. Because of this, teachers must be careful on their actions or opinions towards the students, as it may have a positive or negative effect on their behavior, attitude, facial expressions, sarcasm, thoughts, or even in their self-concept. Self-concept is usually called a mental image of who you are as a person, as our internal interpretation of our actions, skills, and specific characteristics. It's also how a person thinks about, evaluates, or perceives themselves. When people are younger and still go through the self-discovery and identity-forming process, self-concept appears to be more malleable. It means it can be shapeable or it can change because of the influences we get from our experiences from what the society gave us or from what we get or learn from the people around us. And because of this, teachers have a very important role in shaping their students' self-concept. Teachers must create a learning environment where everyone is comfortable and accepted of being their own selves. We must provide activities and assessments where students can explore their own skills talents, or do what they can do without feeling any discomfort or pressure. As teachers, we must understand that we are dealing with different types of students, with different personalities, skills, talents, behaviors, capabilities, thoughts, and etc. We must show them that we support or understand them in order for them to have the opportunity to understand themselves more, to be confident of what they can do, and to have a clear concept of themselves. Remember, to be aware of oneself is to have a concept of oneself. I hope you learned something today. Thank you so much for listening. Let's now proceed to self-efficacy. Self-efficacy helps students believe in themselves. According to Bandura in 1977, self-efficacy is a person's particular set of beliefs that determine how well one can execute a plan of action in prospective situation. It is also a person's belief in their ability to succeed in a particular situation. For us to understand the meaning of self-efficacy, we must learn its difference from self-esteem um, wherein self-efficacy is about the perception of one person to his or her abilities to attain a goal while self-esteem is about the self-worth of a person. What are the characteristics of students with high self-efficacy? Number one, open to challenges. Number two, motivated. Number three, puts effort on tasks and meet commitments. Number four, accepting flaws or failures number five 
can easily recover from disappointments and obstacles. Number six, have short and long-term goals or they, or they are likely to achieve their personal goals. And what are the characteristics of students with low self-efficacy? Number one, uh, they believe they can't be successful. Number two, they don't extend their effort on tasks. Number three, they avoid challenging tasks. And number four, they have low ambition. So, for us to really acquire self-efficacy, better not do those things. The same with teachers. Teachers must also be self-efficient so that he or she can really transfer or um, provide useful and significant knowledge to the students. How are we going to develop our self-efficacy? There are four. Number one, mastery experience or learning from experiences, be it positive or negative experience. Number two, vicarious experiences or social role model, wherein we learn through observing other people doing tasks. Number three, social persuasion or in other words the motivations or feedback from other people around us number four the emotional and physiological states um, it is the positive emotions which boost our confidence all in all as students and future teachers we must learn to develop our self-efficacy so that we could be the best version of ourselves at the same time, we could live a happy and successful life in the future. What is anxiety? Anxiety is a sensation or a feeling of uneasiness, frustrations, self-doubt, fear, or worry. Anxiety can be determined into different levels, or they come in different levels. Anxiety can be triggered by so many things. Some people uh, can be anxious with some random situations while others become anxious through uh, a, a specific events or acts. So, how does anxiety affect uh, students' learning and performance in school? Anxiety has a direct negative impact on students in terms of their capabilities in learning. A student having an anxiety is not easy since anxiety produces discomfort towards the person experiencing when we say a student or a person is having an anxiety he or she is feeling a discomfort towards a certain situation for example if a person or a student is feeling anxious or having an anxiety he or she will be uncomfortable for some situations and this will lead to some behavioral problems that might cause uh, the infectivity of the, that student to learn. The effect of anxiety on academic performance is not always of use. For some instances, a person or a student at first seem fine but suddenly he or she will experience a sudden panic attack or an outburst. So teachers must be aware of these kind of situations in order for them to deal with students having an anxiety. Good evening everyone. Let's talk about creativity. Creativity has the potential for anyone to able to think new and useful ideas. To look at a problem in a new way and find original and work able solution as well as to use one mind in a productive way to generate and apply new ideas. Parang ang sinasabi dito is, ito yung gumagawa ng mga bagay upang upang uh, malagpasan at ma, maayos ang mga bagay o mga problema at masolusyonan ito. Also, creativity is very important in teaching and learning. Because when the teacher is creative and innovative in creating different techniques in teaching, the students will be productive in studying and won't find class boring. Creativity helps both sides a lot by many ways. Most of the students think that studying is boring, 
because the picture just focuses on the discussion itself. That's why it is important that to a teacher will provide different techniques such as giving them fun activities related to the topic to make their discussion exciting. So that will be all. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Jolan Gigantoka and for today's video, we are going to discuss about the epistemological beliefs. Before we go to our topic, what is epistemology? Epistemology means the study of knowledge. This means that the study of what the necessary and conditions are for knowing what a particular statement. And what is epistemological beliefs. According to Bax, Van der Sanden, Sijitsma, Kroon, and Vert Mitten, 2006, epistemology e explores the beliefs we hold about knowledge. It means that epistemology deals about what knowledge is, how knowledge is being constructed, and what creates knowledge. It also believes that about what the foundation of knowledge it will also influence our decision making processes right critical thinking practices and even the facilitate self-regulated learning an epistemological beliefs discusses the ideas we have about knowledge and how it develops and being constructed also these beliefs are important as it affects our thinking skills especially and decision making processes also there are different aspects that affects one knowledge beliefs we all know that each of us has a different beliefs that is why it is important to interact with each other for us to be able to exchange knowledge by this we can we can learn by each other epistemological beliefs most of the epistemological beliefs that we have now is because of our experiences in our daily lives. Our family and our peers plays an important role in developing our epistemology. It is important not to disregard the epistemological beliefs of the students inside the classroom because their differences affect their performance inside the classroom. These beliefs are important because it affects how we deal with variety of knowledge. I also learned that creativity is important in teaching processes because it helps to make your class productive and exciting. The teacher should always think out the box. I mean, the teacher should always think out of the box for them to create different techniques on how they will teach their student creatively because the more the students feel excited towards certain thing the more they participate and learn and that's the epistemological beliefs i hope you understand some people think that they control everything while others think that they are controlled by the world around them and pretty much everything in between Control can be defined as the power to determine outcomes by directly influencing actions, people, and events. The word control becomes even more interesting when we have the word locus, or we call locus of control. Locus is defined as position point or place, or more specifically, a location where something occurs. When combined, Locus of control is defined as the individual's perception about the underlying main causes of events in his or her life. Locus of control can be defined or can be categorized into two, internal and external. People who base their success on their own work and believe they can control their life have internal locus of control. In contrast, People who attribute their success and failure to outside influences have external locus of control. Person's success and failures are due to lack, luck, faith, chance, and actions of other people in more powerful positions. In education, the locus of control 
abuse the causes of students' academic performance or school failure. It is assumed that whether a student has internal or external locus of control has a powerful impact on academic motivation, persistence, and school achievement. For example, there is a group activity in the class to perform. A student with an internal locus of control will think and perform better to contribute to the group and will suggest ideas that make their performance the best. While a student with external locus of control would rather act fairly enough just what is asked to him for to do. Another situation. When a student gets a failing grade, a student have an internal locus of control will blame himself and accept his failure and will take full responsibility to study much better to get higher grade. While students that have external locus of control will quickly blame others for his failure, such as family, friends, classmates, or even teachers, and constantly shift their responsibilities onto other people. To wrap up, people with mindset of internal locus of control take full responsibility for all the things in their life, either good or bad. They believe that everything in their life is a result of the decisions that they have made. In bad situations, they take full responsibility for the outcome. They believe that the situation turned out badly because it is something they choose to do. On the other hand, some people adopt external locus of control because they believe they will seem more competent if they blame other people of their decisions and at some reason, it gives them an excuse to fail or to be lazy. However, by choosing this kind of mindset, you're robbing yourself of the freedom you get from having full control of your life. Therefore, the next time you encounter a situation in your life, always think the best mindset to apply. Interest. Interest in the effective target is the personal preference for certain kinds of activities. It is a powerful motivational process that energizes learning, guides academic and career trajectories, and is essential to academic success. An interest can be an individual experience which they find more enjoyable, which involves feelings, and it can be psychological state of mind which can increase the learner's attention, affect and excitement towards a specific situation. There are four phases of interest development. First, interest develops gradually and through external support, for example, from lecture participation and school field trips. Second, students at different stages of interest development may benefit from different types of external support. It creates more exciting environment to catch the student's attention, which can awaken the learner's individual interest. Third, triggered and maintained situational interest, where a student begins to feel a personal sense of ownership, they started to go beyond what is required and becomes more curious and ask more questions to satisfy curiosity. Lastly, emerging and well-developed individual interest where students will take personal responsibility for their curiosity and question and find a perfect answer or need. We have to remember that all the learners are not the same. Some are still on the process of developing their attitude and some are looking on their own interests and appreciations in life. We are now done with the effective targets. Let us now move forward and learn about the appropriate methods. In appropriate methods, we will discuss about the types, selection, development, and interpretation and utilization. Let us go now to the appropriate methods. Appropriateness of assessment methods are the strategies, techniques, tools, and instruments for collecting information to determine the extent to which the students demonstrate the desired learning outcome. There are 
five common types of appropriateness of assessment methods. First, written response instrument. This includes objective tests such as multiple choice, true or false, matching type, or short answer test. Also includes essays, examinations, and checklists. Objective test is appropriate for the various levels of the hierarchy of educational objectives. Essays, when properly planned, can test the student's graphs of high-level cognitive skills, particularly in areas of application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. The second type is product rating scale. These scales measure products that are frequently rated in education such as book reports, maps, charts, diagram, notebook, essay, and creative endeavor of all sorts. Hello everyone, I am Sarah Lanak, a third year BPED student in Sorsogon State College University. And I'm here to discuss the last three types of assessment. The third assessment is the performance test. Performance test is also known as the authentic or, or the alternative test. It is a form of test that requires students to perform a task rather than answering the ready-made list. One of these is the performance checklist, which consists of the list of behavior that make up a certain type of performance. See example. The fourth type of assessment is oral questioning. Oral questioning is an appropriate assessment method if your objectives are you want to know your student's top knowledge and to determine student's ability to communicate ideas in a coherent verbal sentence. In using oral questioning as an assessment method, you must consider student's state of mind, feelings, anxiety, and nervousness. The fifth type of assessment is observation and report. It is useful as a supplementary assessment method when used in conjunction with oral questioning and oral test. See example here. Selecting an appropriate method is very essential in assessment. And there are two methods teachers can use in assessing the students in the process of teaching and learning and these are observation and questioning. In observation, effective teachers observe their students from the time they enter the classroom. Some teachers greet their students at the door not only to welcome them but also to observe their mood and motivation. During instruction or teaching process, teachers observe students' behavior to gain information about the student's level of interest and understanding of the material or activity. Observation includes looking at nonverbal behaviors as well as listening to what the students are saying. This is very important in order for the teacher to quickly change the methods and strategies he or she is using to easily catch the attention of the students and deliver the topic or the lesson properly. In questioning, teacher asks questions for many instructional reasons, including keeping students' at attention on the lesson, highlighting important points and ideas, promoting critical thinking, allowing students to learn from each other's answers, and providing information about students' learning. Devising good appropriate questions and using students' responses to make effective instant, instantaneous instructional decision is very difficult. So, here are some strategies to improve questioning include planning and writing down instructional questions that will be asked, like allowing sufficient wait time for the students to respond, listening carefully to what students say, rather than listening for what is, ex is ex expected, varying the types of questions asked, making sure some of the questions are higher level, and asking follow-up questions. Hello everyone, I'm Julie Ayo. Today, we will talk about development of effective assessment tools. 
According to Macmillan 2007, the method of assessing targets has three feasible methods to evaluate effective traits and dispositions. The three feasible methods are student self-report, teacher observation, and peer ratings. Student self-report. In this method, there are ways to show students' influence as self-report. The common and coordinate way is having a casual discussion or interview. Students can answer to a survey or questionnaire about themselves or to other students. There are sorts of personal communication that teachers can utilize with their students. It can be discussions, individual interviews, group interviews, and casual conversations to assess effect. The other type under student self-report method is questionnaire and surveys. And there are two types of format using the questionnaire and surveys. It is the constructed response format and selected response format. Constructed response format is a straightforward approach inquiring students about their effect by reacting to statements or questions. The other way to actualize constructed response format is through essay. Second is teacher observation. This method is one of the necessary tools for formative assessment. In using this, the primary thing to do is to determine and advance how particular behaviors relate to the target because there are two student behaviors indicating toward learning positive and negative. Here is the list of positive and negative attitudes toward learning. These behaviors give foundation in creating guidelines, checklists, or rating skills. The positive behaviors are called approach behaviors, whereas the negative ones are named avoidance behaviors. MacMillan 2017 suggested that the best approach is to develop a list of positive and negative behaviors. So, after the list of behaviors has been created, the teacher must choose whether to use an informal, structured observation or a formal one and structured. These two types uh, differ in terms of arrangement and what is recorded. Let's go first and understand the structured observation. This can be used by making summative judgment. In using this, it is essential to have an at least some guidelines and examples of behaviors that demonstrate affected trait. And this is more practical, which suggests teacher teachers can record everything that they have observed and they are not limited limited by what is contained in a checklist or rating skills. Next is the structured observation. It is different from unstructured observation because with regard to preparation needed as well as in the way observation is recorded. That's all for teacher observation. Number three, peer ratings is the least common method among the three feasible methods of the assessing effect. Because of the nature of learners, they don't continuously take this activity seriously and most regularly that not they are subjective, subjective in conducting this peer rating. Hence, peer rating is seen as generally an insufficient in terms of conducting, scoring, interpreting peer ratings. However, Teachers can precisely observe that is being assessed in peer ratings, since teachers are the very much engaged. Interpreting and utilizing the different methods or combination of methods in assessing effect. Each of the feasible methods or student self-report, teacher observation, and peer rating has its own advantage and disadvantages. In choosing for which method or methods to be utilized, consider the following factors. The first factor is type of effect that needs to be assessed. 
A common response to something or someone can be best be gathered through observation. Nevertheless, if an attitude component is to be diagnosed, a self-report will give a better knowledge. Second factor is if the information needed is from group or individual responses and if a group response and tendencies are required, selected response self-report method is suitable because it guarantees anonymity and is easily scored. The third factor is the use of information. If the intention of the effective assessment is to utilize the outcomes as supporting info to grading, then multiple approaches is essential and to be mindful to the plausibility of having fake comps from self-report and even from peer judgment. Interpreting and utilizing the different methods or combination of methods in assessing effect. In choosing which method or methods to utilize, there are following factors that needs to be considered. The first one is the type of effect that needs to be assessed. A common response to something or someone can best be gathered through observation. Nevertheless, if an attitude component is to be diagnosed, a self-report will give a better knowledge. If the information needed is from group or individual response, if group response and tendencies are required, selected response and self-support method is suitable because it guaranteed self-anonymity. The third factor is the use of information. The intention of the effective assessment is to utilize these outcomes as supporting input to grading. The multiple approaches is essential and be mindful of the plausibility of having fake comes from self-report and even from peer judgment. We are now done with the appropriate methods, and we are heading to our last discussion. This is about the other effective measures and assessments, which has three subtopics. These are non-test indicators, transversal competencies, and 21st century learning skills. Non-test indicators for effective measures and assessments. Recognizing that the student's emotional state is integral to his ability to learn, educators now place emphasis on testing in the effective domain. With this increasing demand for test data, ethical considerations must be taken into account as measurement instruments are designed, administered, and interpreted. Classrooms deal with a big number of students in one class or in one subject. And this number of students brings differences in intelligence and learning styles. Facing those differences among the students leads teachers to be frustrated in choosing kinds of assessments that are appropriate to achieve the learning goals. Teachers examine students in order to decide how much they understand and how well their academic skills are growing. Testing, especially academic tests, are a popular evaluation method that focuses more on cognitive development, but it is not the only evaluation option available to teachers. By assessing through alternative means, teachers will ensure that the inability to conduct assessments does not contribute to the student's abilities being misunderstood. A school must pursue goals not just focusing on the high test scores of its students but also on their personality, attitude, and behavior while learning, which affects their social being. This can be seen in the students' performances while not being informed that they are being judged. These are tests that do not force the students to give their responses, but rather allow the students to manifest their acquired knowledge and skills from the subject. These are tests that do not force the students to give their responses, but rather allow the students to manifest their acquired knowledge and skills from the subject. This is one of the authentic assessment methods that are able to zoom in on the effectiveness and efficiency of the employed teaching methodologies, techniques, and styles. There is a number of 
non-test assessments that teachers can choose to assess their students. The assessment tools that can be included are Portfolios Portfolio can be defined as the collection of a student's work, progress, or activity during the teaching and learning process. A teacher looks not at one piece of work as a measure of a student's understanding, but instead at the body of work the students have produced over time. Using portfolios as an alternative assessment demonstrates the student's creativity, critical thinking ability, and problem-solving ability that are comprehensive information to focus on the process than the product only. The purpose of portfolios is to improve students' learning, to encourage students in the learning process, and to make the students responsible for their learning. To allow for portfolio assessment, a teacher must compile student work throughout the term. This is commonly accomplished by providing each student with a folder in which to store essays or other large activities. Upon compilation of the portfolio, the teacher can review the body of work and determine the degree to which the work indicates the student's understanding of the content. Anecdotal records It is used to record specific observations of individual students' behaviors, skills, and attitudes as they relate to the outcomes in the program of study. Such notes provide cumulative information on student learning and direction for further instruction. Anecdotal notes are often written as the result of ongoing observations during the lessons and may also be written in response to a product or performance the student has completed. They are brief, objective, and focused on specific outcomes. Next is questionnaires. Questionnaire is a list of questions that should be filled by the respondent. Generally, the questionnaire is used to gain data about students' backgrounds as one of the data sources to analyze students' behavior and learning process. Moreover, the data gathered from the questionnaire may be the information about the difficulties faced by the students during the teaching and learning process, such as learning strategies, teacher and parents' assistance, and others. Interviewing involves the interaction in which an interviewer collects information from students with a sequence of questions and listens for answers. This kind of interaction can be a rich source of information to inform the teacher about how the students understand concepts and use procedures they learn from the course and provide valuable information and directions for the teacher in modifying the course for improvement. The next one is the observation. It is focused on observing the external behavior of an individual or understanding the environment by the sense organs. It is either controlled or uncontrolled. The results must be carefully focused and thoroughly recorded. It should be valid, reliable, and accurate. It could be personal observation or group observation. Requisite of a good observation must have proper planning, skillful execution, recording, and interpretation of the observation. The next one is checklist. Checklist is used to record the presence or absence of an item. It consists of a prepared list of items by checking yes or no or inserting appropriate numbers or words. It is based on a matter of fact and not by judgment or opinion. Checklist is used for evaluation of self. Basically, it is an instrument of observation. It involves the questions or answers which is signed by the respondents. And it also involves the characteristics about a particular subject to be evaluated. A checklist is useful when it comes to survey and research. The amount of characteristic or traits will be known. It is helpful to give appropriate guidance to the subject. Therefore, to know the developmental direction of a specific behavior, a checklist pattern can be used. As for its limitation, as only a sign is used for checklist, therefore, there is no other options found. A checklist is subjective and biased. 
it is difficult to evaluate the personality of these students and their adjustment capacity by using only the checklist. The last one is the rating scale. A rating scale is a set of categories designed to elicit information about a qualitative or quantitative attribute. A rating scale is a very important technique when it comes to assessment. Rating is the assessment of a person by another person. Therefore, the personality of an individual is assessed not by himself but by another person who knows him well, such as a teacher to a student. A rating scale is an improvement over checklist. While a checklist simply records what happened or that something happened, a rating scale adds another dimension, how much and how well it happened. In a commonest type of a rating scale, the column opposite to the list of traits can be captioned by the qualitative terms such as good, average, or poor, or by quantitative terms such as always, sometimes, or never. There are several types of a rating scale, for example, a numerical scale, wherein a specific number is assigned each trait. For example, 7 is the representation of the maximum amount of the traits in the individual and 4 as the average. Method of comparison, wherein the rater compares each person being rated in respect to the traits of every other individual being rated through the use of general terms such as equal, better, or worse. Hi everyone, I'm Marvita Josicad and now we will talk about transversal competencies. To equip learners with knowledge and skills to cope with different changes, education system, in the region have increasingly emphasized the importance of transversal competencies. Transversal competencies which refer to knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes that are integral to life in the 21st century. It is also the development of transversal com competence begins in early childhood and continues throughout one's life. Developing transversal com competence is taken into account in all pre-primary education activities. The new core curriculum places an emphasis on transversal competencies in instruction. A changing society demands more and more transversal skills and competencies. Therefore, it is important that each subject promotes transversal competencies. The aims set for transversal com competencies include thinking and learning to learn, cultural competence, interaction and self-expression, taking care of oneself and managing daily life, multi-literacy, ICT competence, working life competence and entrepreneurship, participation, involvement, and building a sustainable future. The aims of transversal competencies are specified in the national core curriculum. Education providers are able to further define them according to their individual areas of emphasis. Transversal competencies are always taught, studied, and assessed as part of the different subjects. We are now done defining what transversal competencies are. Now, let's move on to assessing transversal competencies. To teach transversal skills, teachers require new skills and approaches that are more interactive and student-centered. And this is where the challenges come in. School principals and teachers revealed that many felt that they lack adequate support for teaching transversal competencies with inadequate teacher training, instruction and education materials, and confidence in delivering the lessons. Now, transversal competencies are essentially about processes. Assessment strategies that have been effective in the past to measure students' learning that is primarily content-based may not be appropriate for student learning that is focusing on developing and enhancing competencies. Traditionally, assessment in education has focused on endpoints. In an education system that includes transversal competencies, the learning target is the student's capacity to process and use information and their developing competence in this, not their ability to store and recall 
facts. Now let's move on to the assessment of transversal competencies in different countries of Asia-Pacific region. Based on our report, which is an outcome of collaborative regional study on assessment of transversal competencies in nine countries in Asia-Pacific region conducted, with inclusion of transversal competencies in the curriculum, 87% of the participating teacher said yes in changing their ways of teaching and assessment. Some teachers in Vietnam and Australia noted that they plan lesson more explicitly based on a particular transversal competencies. Some examples of change in teaching and assessment includes the use of new methods such as conducting field studies and using technology, example, computer-based tasks, assessment that focus on both skills and knowledge, and assessments that cover more competencies. Assessment strategies such as portfolio assessment, practical tasks, and character assessments, and etc. have been implemented by some teachers in Australia, Mongolia, Thailand, and Philippines. Teachers in Malaysia use hands-on activities such as science experiment and student-centered projects to assess students' transversal competencies such as collaboration skills, resourcefulness, and creativity in presentation. According to teachers in India, teaching practices have changed in terms of their patterns of questioning, wherein more opportunities for students are provided to express their thoughts or to reflect visualize, engage, and interact. Transversal competencies assessments were done through classroom observations, integrated projects across subjects, and through performances or skill-based activities. A majority of teachers in each country reported having learning objectives related to transversal competencies included in the lessons and that these learning objectives guided their assessment practices. According to the teachers, transversal competencies assessments are included in academic and non-academic subjects as well as co-curricular activities in school. And that's it for the assessment of transversal competencies. Hello everyone! My name is Raniel Ernakis Twaya and I'm your teacher for today. And now we are going to learn about 21st century skills. So let's start! The term 21st century skills refers to a broad set of knowledge, skills, work habits, and character traits that are believed by educators, school reformers, college professors, employers, and others to be critically important to success in today's world, particularly in collegiate programs and contemporary careers and workplaces. Generally speaking, 21st century skills can be applied in all academic subject areas and in all educational, career, and civic settings throughout the student's life. What are 21st century skills? 21st century skills are 12 abilities that today's students need to succeed in their careers during the information age. The 12 21st century skills are critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, information literacy, media literacy, Technology literacy, flexibility, leadership, initiative, productivity, and social skills. These skills are intended to help students keep up with the lightning pace of today's modern markets. Each skill is unique in how it helps students, but they all have one quality in common. They are essential in the age of the internet. And now, let's proceed to the three 21st century skill categories. Each 21st century skill is broken 
into one of three categories. First, learning skills. Second, literacy skills. And the last one, life skills. Learning skills teaches students about the mental processes required to adopt and improve upon a modern work environment. Next, literacy skills focuses on how students can discern facts, publishing outlets, and the technology behind them. There is a strong focus in determining trustworthy sources and factual information to separate it from the misinformation that floods the internet. Lastly, the life skills. Take a look at the intangible elements of a student's everyday life. This intangible focuses on both personal and professional qualities. Altogether, these categories cover all 12 21st century skill that con contribute to a student's future career. The four C's are by far the most popular 21st century skills. These skills are also called learning skills. More educators know about these skills because they are universal needs for any career. They are also vary in terms of importance depending on an individual's career aspirations. The four C's of 21st century skills are critical thinking. It's all about finding solutions to problems. Next, creativity. Thinking outside the box. The third one, collaboration. Working with others. And the last one, communication. Talking to others. Arguably, critical thinking is the most important quality for someone to have in health sciences. In business settings, critical thinking is essential to improvement. It's a mechanism that weeds out problems and replaces them with fruitful endeavors. It's what helps students figure stuff out for themselves when they don't have a teacher at their disposal. Creativity is equally important as a means of adaptation. This skills empowers students to see concepts in a different light which leads to innovation. In any field, innovation is key to the adaptability and overall success of a company. Learning creativity is a skill requires someone to understand that the way things have always been done may have been best 10 years ago but someday that has to change. Collaboration means getting students to work together, achieve compromises and get the best possible results from solving a problem. Collaboration may be the most difficult concept in the four C's, but once it's mastered, it can bring companies back from the brink of bankruptcy. The key element of collaboration is willingness. All participants have to be willing to sacrifice parts of their own ideas and adopt others to get results for the company. That means Understanding the idea of a greater good, which is in this case tends to be company-wide success. Finally, communication is the glue that brings all of these educational qualities together. Communication is a requirement for any company to maintain profitability. It's crucial for students to learn how to effectively convey ideas among different personality types. That has the potential to eliminate confusion in a workplace which makes your students valuable parts of their teams, departments, and companies. Effective communication is also one of the most underrated soft skills in the United States. For many, it's viewed 
as a given and some companies may even take good communication for granted. But when employees communicate poorly, who projects fall apart? No one can clearly see the objectives they want to achieve. No one can take responsibility because nobody's claimed it. Without understanding, proper communication students in the 21st century will lack a vital skill to progress their careers. Let us now learn about the next category of the 21st century learning skills, which is the literacy skills, which focuses on how the students discern facts, publishing outlets, and the technology behind them. The 21st century literacy skill includes I, M, and T. I stands for information literacy, M stands for media literacy, and T stands for technology literacy. Now let us learn about information literacy. What is information literacy? It is a skill which makes you understand facts from fiction, figures, statistics, and data you have searched or you could search on the internet. On the age of chronic misinformation, finding truth and facts online have become a job all on its own. It's crucial that students know and um, have the ability to identify facts and trustworthy sources online all on their own. Um, if they have no idea or does not have this kind of skill, they might um, end up um, embracing misinformation and misconceptions. This is the reason why students on this generation must develop these skills in order for them to not be afraid of misinformation and a sources which are not reliable. Second one is media literacy. What is media literacy? It is a practice of identifying publishing method, outlets, and sources while distinguishing which are credible and which are not. Just like the previous skill, media literacy is also helpful in finding truth in a world of saturated information. This is how the student finds trustworthy sources of information. They could also learn which information or media outlet and formats to trust and which are not. It is important that a student know which sources to trust and which are not, which are equally important. The last one is technology literacy. Technology literacy gives the student the basic information they need in order to understand what type of gadget or computers or um, tools performs what task and why this gives the student the knowledge or information to understand or know what to use in a certain task or particular activity in order to make things easier, which is the purpose of technology. The third category is what you call the life skills. The life skills have five major parts, which is also known called as an acronym called FLIPS, which F stands for flexibility, L stands for leadership, I stands for initiative, and P stands for productivity, and also S stands for social skills. Let's start off from flexibility. Flexibility means deviating plans from one another or it means to have plan A or plan B. Plan A is required to achieve your main goal. 
and plan B should be reserved for any situation that may come handy. So, flexibility is one of the most challenging life skill of a student because there are two uncomfortable ideas which is the first one is not all plans is the best plan to do what is proposed to do so for further explanation one plan is not enough for you to succeed so you have to be better have more plans and number two you always have to admit that sometimes you are wrong it is the true talent of flexibility you need to admit admit whether you're right or wrong because not all the time your plan will succeed so that's how important to have a backup plan and that's what flexibility makes the most challenging skill of 21st century skill flexibility able students learn that they always have a lot more to learn and they should have shown humility the next one is leadership leadership by means of leading the group or the pack to a certain goal to achieve success leadership is not simple because you have to admit yourself that not all the time your group or your members will follow you or respect you as a leader so leadership is one of a talent that requires focus and determination and when we say determination um, it is the urge to achieve the same goal collaboratively so leadership is much important to achieve greatness also leadership is a skill that you will not use only in life as a student you can also use it in the future when you have your future job the third one is initiative initiative same goes with leadership and flexibility because initiative should require the urge to initiate or to do a job also true success involves initiative it forms the quality of a student that they should have enable to be a successful student you have to initiate for yourself as i said earlier it comes with leadership and flexibility because initiative takes courage and based from the studies initiative is always a stepping stone to achieve success alongside with initiative 21st century skills require productivity productivity means making something more productive to further explain productivity making even small things count like for example by time management even the most single minute you can use it to do some tasks 
that will ensure your success. Productivity doesn't mean to be hardworking. Productivity simply means to make the most of your time. It is used to make your time more efficient. The last one is the one that ties all that is in the acronym of LIPS, which is the social skills. You may notice that social skills connects all the mentioned before skills. Social skills enables you to have the skill which how to communicate with others and how to work with others. Social skill is also a talent because social skills require determination and courage same as the skills that are mentioned before. It is important to make connections, relationships to others in making the same goal. So that's all what's in the acronym of FLIPS that is the third category of the 21st century skills. As a result, today's students possess a wide range of social skills. Some are more socially adept than others. Some are far behind their peers. And some lucky few may be far ahead. As socializing comes naturally to them. But most students need a crash course in social skills at least. Etiquette, manners, politeness, and small talk still play major roles in today's world. That means some students need to learn them in an educational setting instead of a social setting. We are all done discussing the other effective measures and assessments, the last topic of this webcast. And that is everything about the authentic assessment of the effective domain. I hope you have learned a lot from this webcast. Before we end this webcast, we would like to acknowledge the head of this activity. Maria Flora Reno Valles, our instructor in assessment in learning. The video editing and animation, Jeremiah C. Talento, and Kate Balliot, and all the third year Bachelor of Physical Education students who have been part of this webcast. Thank you and keep safe.